Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of our show Tiebreak. Glad to have you with us and I'm delighted to say once again I'm joined by my good friend, the editor of Cricket World, John Pennington. John, how are you today? Very well, Aaron, how are you? Yeah, doing well, John. It's been a, a, another busy week of, of sport, hasn't it? And uh, Well, with cricket, we've had the Champions, uh, the Champions League going on, John, but there's been a few things down with bowlers' actions and I know it's sort of sitting on the right in the latest one called. What, what are your thoughts on this, John? Maybe it's taken, you could argue it's taken a bit too long, but it's happening now and it's good to see that there is a crackdown that's taking place. Yeah, I agree. You have to draw the line somewhere. They've got the 15 degree rule and, and they've got to start applying it. I mean, Sal Ajman was over 40 degrees, so how, how he's sort of got away with it for as long as he has is, is, is the more pertinent question. I mean, yeah, we, we've all seen tweets saying, oh, you know, why aren't any spinners of the big three, that's Australia, England and India being called? Well, England and Australia do not produce unorthodox spinners, you could argue. They don't produce unorthodox players. You know, I could give you a, a list of England unorthodox players who aren't in the game anymore because whether, you know, uniform coaching at an early age is a good thing or a bad thing is another debate, but it certainly does not result in you having unorthodox spinners who deflect the robo too much. So that's why you're not going to get spinners being called in England and Australia because generally there aren't any. Uh, India's a, a bit more of a complex case, which I probably have to do a bit more research in, but uh, it's purely coincidence that, uh, you know, that the, the unorthodox spinners, the, the people who are being called, are, are from outside the big three. But in my mind, there's absolutely no conspiracy, there's no corruption here, that people are being called who are not bowling properly. No, I'm with you completely on that, JP. Made the finals, had to play Tommy Robredo, who he had a decent record against, but Robredo's a very gutsy kind of competitor. And Robredo had five, <clears throat> we talk about great comebacks, JP, Robredo had five championship points in that second set, and Murray came all the way back and took that title, which I thought was really big for him. He hasn't won a title all year, it wasn't the biggest tournament in the world, but it, it gave him some confidence. Got to the semi-finals here in Beijing, um, obviously lost to Djokovic this morning. Now, uh, I will say, as well as Murray's played in the last few weeks, I do feel that Djokovic is now starting to get into his head because if you look at their career, Djokovic has won their first four matches, but Murray was quite green and quite young. After that, the two of them were very, very evenly matched. and I've actually watched Murray versus Djokovic live in Miami, and Djokovic won that fairly comfortably. The thing with those two when they play, they're both such amazing athletes and baseliners that even if the match is fairly one-sided in the scoreline, it doesn't look one-sided. Every rally feels like it's an event because it's so physical. Um, but actually, if you look at their head-to-head -head now, excluding Wimbledon, where obviously Murray had that amazing win, Djokovic has now won the last six out of seven matches between the two of them. And to put it in perspective, JP, Shanghai, which is two years ago, like this time two years ago, the head-to-head -head was actually 8-7, um, Djokovic and Murray. It was 8-7 in Djokovic's favour. Murray had five championship points in that match. 
And had he won it, it would have been 8 all. And now since then, it's gone 14 8. So you do feel that as much as Murray's recovering, he's getting back. Djokovic is slightly in his head a little bit. But overall, I think he'll be very happy. You know, he's kind of won a title, made a semi. And some people were criticising him because there's another tournament in, in Tokyo this week where maybe the standard hasn't been quite as good. You've got Nishikori, Ryanick. People saying he could have gone there, got some easier points and had a better chance of making London. But I actually don't look at it that way. I think if he wants to get back to winning slams and being near the top, he's done, he's done the right thing. You know, He's put himself up against the best players, which is what he needs to do to, to win slams. And over in Tokyo, we've got um, Nishikori and Ryanick in the final. Which, which Nishikori, I guess, is continuing his great form. Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously, Nadal's back in Beijing, you know, his first tournament back since, since Wimbledon. And he played Martin Kleijan, who's a left, left-hander. Um, and he struggled a bit with Kleijan. He lost a set to him at Wimbledon this year, but you kind of felt Nadal would, you know, would come through. But Nadal lost in a final set tiebreak to, to Kleijan. Um, and I was doing some research, and actually Kleijan came through qualifying. And in his final round of qualifying was 6-4, 5-1, 40 love down against a 942 player in the world from China. Won that and obviously went all... So it just shows you, doesn't it, in tennis, how it's very fine line between world number one and sort of someone in the few hundreds. These guys can all play and it's off the take of the granted, actually. It certainly does, and I suppose that, that just shows the, you know, the level to, to sustain that performance and stay in the top 10, top 100. It must be, uh, be sort of taken for granted, I suppose. A- a- absolutely, JP. I think we saw that at Wimbledon this year. I mean, guys like Krivios were beating Nadal, who's ranked 144. It's, it's just comes down to consistency and, and probably belief. But it's, it, there really are that one or two percent sort of difference between a lot of these players. And often it is overlooked at times. We focus so much on the big four, and rightly so, with all that they've achieved, you know, the big three or four guys. But there's a lot of talent all the way down in men's tennis at the moment. So, JP, I mean, that's uh, talking from one individual sport to another with, with a bit of a team. Team a little bit. We talked on the, the Ryder Cup last week and you predicted there'd be no no comebacks and there weren't, but for a little while on that Sunday evening, sorry, Sunday morning, the, the US did look as if they might sort of uh, be onto something there, didn't they? It was a really exciting finish for a while. Yes, it did. I mean, it was interesting how that uh, final day singles played out because, obviously, you know, we, you put out McElroy and McDowell early and McDowell was, was three, three or four, he was three down, wasn't he? That's and right, he, yeah, he was. You would say we're just beginning to turn the scoreboards red and a comeback. It was always going to be very, very unlike them. We would have to, you know, play unbelievable golf all the way through the day. But for a brief period of an hour or two, they, they were they were just about clinging on until uh, obviously Mandel fought back and Macoy sort of ran away with his game. But uh, no, it, was, it, was, it was another, you know, entertaining Ryder Cup. I mean, really, obviously, you know, did win the singles on the final day, but where really that tournament was won and lost was the foursome. I mean, uh, Europe won the foursome seven one. That, that is an enormous unprecedented margin for one particular mode of play that's really that was a massive difference between the two sides and interesting to hear how the Americans are now sort of saying that we need to almost copy Europe's template and get this together because for quite a while apart from the, the European shambles in 2008 they, they've not really come particularly close and the diner accepted to, to really beating Europe so they've got a few things to think about but they, they've come back yeah, it, it was briefly on, but uh, they couldn't quite do it and say, you know, dropping seven points in the foursomes as they did, that, that that's, you, know, you, you can't afford to do that. No, completely. And, and it did come over to me, JP, like you're saying in the foursomes, you saw that there was a real team unity, wasn't there? A real belief, like the way McElroy and Garcia rescued that half point. You know, little little moments like that, wasn't it, which really sort of seemed to help Europe, and they were really buoyed from that, and you say they were just so dominant in, in that element of the game as well. Yeah, and foursomes is obviously all about partnerships. You, know, you need to get your, your players who will put nearly every drive in the fairway, nearly every ball on the green. You, you, you've got to sort of... And, and you get players that work well together. I think there's a few int- a few poor choices that the, the Americans made. You know, they didn't put... I think they didn't put the rookies out on one, ones that they expect to go out. And Wilkerson did play in the foursome. He's not really a, a brilliant foursomes player, but uh, didn't play in the four balls where you would have expected him to. So... They did sort of contribute to their own demise there, but Europe just seemed to pick up on, as you say, that sort of real team element of foursomes, and it's absolutely stormed clear. So, uh, no, all, all credit to them, really. Uh, absolutely, JP. No, it was a fantastic event, and we look forward to the next one in uh, in 2016 in Minnesota. Absolutely. And uh, some, some news you wanted to sort of bring in an update today, and on, on LeBron James. Uh, tell me more. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we've got the, uh, as we all know, the NBA season starts in, in a few weeks' time. There's been quite a lot of anticipation around that. And as we, we talked a couple of months ago on one of our shows, JP, uh, LeBron's made a move back to, to Cleveland, which has obviously attracted a lot of attention, his first team. And since his move, obviously a lot's changed. He's become a two-time NBA champion. What I found very interesting was they had the, he, he did an official interview with one of the TV stations, like a one-on-one, -on -one, and he spoke with so much confidence. He spoke about how he's lost a lot of weight. Not that it was fat, obviously a lot of muscle, but he's cut down because he feels that he, he wants to be even faster and he feels he's going to be a real threat. You can see how, how hard he's working. But in an official press conference for the Cleveland Cavaliers, normally LeBron loves being the centre of attention. He loves having plenty to say, you know, when he's with the Miami Heat. This year, because he's not surrounded by stars, a very well-respected basketball journalist, Bill Wrighton, was kind of was saying that it was almost like LeBron didn't want to speak to the media. Not that he was like being rude or standoffish, but he just his mind was elsewhere. It was all, and but yet all the rookies were are so excited because all of a sudden now they've got a real chance to them and of actually winning a title. But he said it wasn't that LeBron was being rude. It just came over to him that LeBron didn't want it to be the LeBron show. He was almost kind of like this is we're, we're a team here. And I, I thought it's really nice to see actually, isn't it? Someone kind of giving back to his team in that way, not trying. To, he could easily just have made that all about him, but he, he kind of sensed the moment and just tried to make it into a, into a bigger event than it was. JP, talking, you just touched on rugby there. I think there was a, a very interesting rugby comeback you want to tell us about as well, JP. As soon as we've talked about his comeback, we've seen some, some of the most incredible comebacks in, in world sport. So I don't know, you know, it just shows you, I think, when you open your eyes to these things, just how, how determined a lot of these athletes are around the world, isn't it? How they just keep fighting, and it's incredible to watch. Absolutely. Well, we'll go over some very interesting people uh, views on Twitter um, in terms of your comebacks. So keep tweeting those in. We'll keep that running for a little while longer. JP, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Aaron. Pleasure as always. And remember, guys, keep following us on Twitter at Tybright Sports. And once we reach 100, you'll win one of these uh, very cool Bones Original shirts. And we'll see you all next time.